In the nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Veni, Sancte Spiritus, reple tuorum corre fidelium, et tui amoris in ei signum accende, emite Spiritum tuum et creabuntur. Et renovabis facientere. Oremus Deus, qui corre fidelium, Sancti Spiritus, illustratione locovisti, dan obis in iodem Spiritu recta sapere, et de eius semper consolatione godere per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Sede sapientiae. Ora pro nobis. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. So, am I still restricted to this board right here? All right, so last time we were talking about how the, the various European states were finding the, the, you might call them ecclesiastical taxes to be somewhat burdensome as part of the general malcontent that was arising at the time uh, of which Luther took advantage. And we're, we're still laying the groundwork for him a bit. We're going to take a look into how some of his, his heretical ideas formed from things that he was taught earlier on, the things he himself taught. And so we're still, we're still working on or laying the groundwork the, uh, or digging the holes for the dynamite <laughs> that we were talking about. So we're still, we're still working on that. And, we're, this is a, and when you have such an explosive event like this, you need to build up to it a great deal. So the, uh, the taxation, as we said, which had started at the time of the residence of the popes at Avignon in consequence of the real state of need in which the central government of the church then stood, became a more and more an oppressive burden, especially in Germany. It was exploited by Luther in one of his earliest controversial writings, where voicing the popular discontent in, uh, in, the, in the German language, says uh, the, or the author says in a spiteful language of which he was a master, although of course, I mean, not just the German language, but it means more of his, his invective. It's not really referring to German. Uh, he joined his protest to that of the German estates of the realm. So he had, he had a bone to pick also and took advantage of this rising tide of resentment. So he took some things that were true, other things that were perhaps more fanciful. But in any case, he made a, a, essentially a propaganda tool out of the administration of the, of the papal finances, essentially how the, the, the expenses of the papal court, how money was managed there, etc. Uh, he made it a, a very popular weapon and also a terribly effective one. So, of course, we saw because of previous popes who were in, in some way in some way lacking, uh, whether in fact uh, being worldly and disedifying or just in reputation, Pope Alexander VI, uh, the authority of the Holy See had suffered considerably in addition to, of course, the Great Western Schism, which, uh, wh whose effects were still very much being felt at the time. There were also, and another thing that weakened the authority of the papacy were the, the councils that tried to, uh, tried to put themselves above the Pope, whether the schismatic council of Pisa or the, the council of Basel after it went rogue, so to speak, uh, and just the general conciliar ideas, everything, so, so many factors were coming together to weaken the authority of the Holy See, uh, at least in the minds of the people. Of course, the authority of the Holy See is always it's always the same. It's always the authority of Christ ruling over the church. But in the minds of the people, the I might say the prestige of the Holy See had been weakened by these things. And you can see why. You can see why people would be would be, well, for one thing, would would might start looking less to the to the Pope because of the Great Western Schism. Because they for so long the question was, well, is he even really the Pope? And see why they would start looking to him because of that. And then you know, just when Pope becomes disedifying, it's going to uh, deservedly or not, it's going to lower the office, the, the dignity of the office in the mind, in the in the eyes of people. Of course, the dignity of the office and the power of it is always the same, but it's going to lower it in people's minds. And you know, another another problem was just the fact that the papacy had been in Avignon for as long as it was. That it, the Pope came to be seen as you know, a creature of the French state almost. And of course, so the the 
the Avignon during the Great Western Schism, the Avignon popes are now generally considered to have been anti popes, uh, were more so. Uh, they were uh, very much allied with the, the French monarchy. So we talked about scandalous behavior of the of just the, the, we'd say the low state of morals in Italy in general at the time. And then you have, of course, uh, Alexander VI and the general reputation of the Borgia family, uh, the, the bearing of Julius II, who was more of a soldier than an ecclesiastic. And then Pope Leo X, of course, whose reign uh, Martin Luther really comes to fame during, or, or more like infamy. Uh, he, his, it has to be admitted that his court was, was, uh, was worldly. Uh, and without a doubt, all of these things, uh, whether, whether they were true, whether they were true uh, observations, true, uh, true shortcomings in the, in the state of Christendom at the time, or whether uh, there were only rumors or even just uh, things that were made up, Luther was, uh, he heard a lot about these things when he was teaching at Wittenberg. And of course, what he himself saw at Rome would have definitely have uh, still, still worsened his impressions. And also remember that there was a, a general in, in Germany, of course, Germany, that's to be taken loosely at the time, there was no single German state. It had the Holy Roman Empire, but it was a loose confederation. There was a general anti-Roman feeling, sentiment in, in Germany because of the clashes between Emperor Frederick Barbarossa and, uh, and popes earlier on. Remember, you may remember studying that last year, uh, how much trouble Barbarossa caused in his earlier career. He, he, towards the end of his life, and of course he died on a crusade, he died on a crusade, so he made, I'd say, some reparations for all the trouble he caused the papacy, but the, the effects of all the clashes that took place were still making themselves felt. So all of these things, there's so many different factors, like in any disaster, many different factors coming together that are going to make conditions just right for the explosion that Martin Luther is going to cause in the, the near future from where we are in, in uh, history right now. So you might say all of these, all these currents uh, were waiting for one man, and that was Martin Luther, who, who finally um, pressed the plunger or set off the explosion. All of these currents were waiting for someone to come and ignite everything. It was almost as if you'd found, the, again, a large pile of combustible material. Uh, see, he said uh, some of his, in his, some of his, so looking more specifically what he complained about, in his first lectures at Wittenberg, he complains that neither monasteries nor colleges nor cathedral churches will in any sort accept discipline. Again, to make a generalized statement like that is most likely that's exaggerated. Uh, there there may, must have been significant numbers of, he says, monasteries, colleges, and cathedral churches who, which were disciplined. But there was enough of it, there was enough lack of discipline in those institutions and the churches, um, uh, academic institutions at the time. There was enough lack of discipline that, that it caused sufficient disedification for him to take advantage of. And he said that, uh, again, again, he's generalizing a lot, but he said in another place that uh, the clergy should be the eyes of the church, but today they do not direct the body, meaning the faithful, for they are blinded, they are the soul, but they do not give life, but rather kill by their deadly example. About nothing do they trouble less than about souls. So... Again, it is certainly a generalization, and like any generalization that's going to include some exaggeration, you can't imagine that every single cleric, every single bishop was like this. But again, there was enough of it for his accusations to stick, if you will. Uh, he said that, uh, <laughs> uh, that bishops and priests were simply full of the most abominable unchastity, and that may have been true to an extent, but there were... It was uh, uh, impure behavior among the clergy. But again, as we see, we'll see in his later career, he was not exactly one to complain about that. Uh, then he said that they bring to the pulpit nothing but their views and fables, nothing but masquerading and buffoonery. 
And then he said, this, also, the strength of her youth has forsaken her. So he's being very dramatic about this. But there's the... Although we have to say that he was already starting to fall away from the church's teaching even before he began to dispute about indulgences with a man called Tetzel. You may have heard of him before. He was the one who was preaching the indulgences, pushing the, uh, trying to uh, raise mo and raising money for St. Peter's. He said, you, raise, you give us money, you know, the indulgences are attached to that. And in itself, it's not a problem that you would receive an indulgence for, giving, for contributing to something like the building of St. Peter's. But he was pushing it too hard. But and then Luther, of course, taking scandal at that and going too far in his opposition to it. Yes. Oh yes. Uh, spelled almost like pretzel. Oops. Pretzel. Almost like pretzel. Rhymes with it. And then, of course, his, his moral changes uh, went clearly hand-in-hand hand with his theological views, which we'll see soon. We'll see how his uh, basically various points of theology he'd been taught in the Occamist school, which we'll see. Have you seen William of Occam at all in the Modern Errors class? Yeah? Okay. So again, he was affected by, by that whole school. Uh, and we'll see how some of the theological, more specifically the theological, elements of the alchemist school began to affect him. Uh, and we saw earlier his growing indifference to good works, uh, his refusal to do, do the indulgence practice of climbing the Santa Scala at Rome. Uh, so and it was in 1513 that he began at Wittenberg University, his commentary on the Psalms, uh, which, let's see, uh, so, and then after that, uh, the, uh, his lectures dealt with St. Paul's epistle to the Romans and their, their stories surrounding that. So uh, the first uh, work written and published by Luther himself was, uh, was homiletic. It was his commentary on the seven penitential psalms published in the very year 1517. And the same year, or if not that, then the next year, our author says, uh, he published his expositions on the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. And these are these consisted of excerpts of his sermons sent to him, uh, sent by him to the press. So it was cobbled together. Uh, and then, but there was after that that his 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 famous ninety five theses uh, were published, and that led directly to the debate on indulgences. But it was at the end of fifteen eighteen that his teaching was complete. Of course, he's fifteen seventeen is the big date that's associated with Martin Luther. But it, he was still, say, he was still developing his heresies at the time. And then it was around that it was at that time that uh, he had he he'd sort of finalized uh, his new element, uh, the doctrine of absolute individual certainty of salvation by fiducial faith, as he called it. Um, we'll see, of course, we'll see everything in detail later. But he regarded it, and his followers did the same, as the cornerstone of evangelical Christianity now once again recovered. That's how they thought of it. In fact, Luther thought, or he held that, essentially, that the true church was, consisted in the past, because, of course, he you know, rejecting the Catholic Church altogether. But his, his idea was that the true church through all the, all the previous centuries had been consisted of all the heretics that had been opposed to the church. That was it. So that, that was the company that he put himself in. And then at the beginning of 1519, uh, he published his new commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians and also uh, a new commentary on the Psalms, uh, almost simultaneously published. And you know, he, he puts forth his ideas in all those things again, his, 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 uh, his, 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 faith, his ideas on faith. Uh, so we could sort of... You could almost divide his development of these things into two sections, up until, up until 1517, and then after that, when he, when he uh, added his uh, doctrine of the necessity of belief in personal justification uh, and future salvation. 
And then you know, we'll see we'll see all these things later. But the second stages in the years 1517 and 1518 began with uh, the uh, consisted uh, included the, his his trial at Augsburg, uh, where he was uh, uh, gradually acquiring that absolute certainty of salvation, to which he finally attained through an illumination which he was um, accustomed to regard as as God's own work, as his own personal moment of inspiration. So we'll see all of this in more detail. Uh, but in his commentary on the Psalms, uh, Luther sometimes made in there um, statements that were characteristic about himself. Like he said, uh, when he must have been in a fit of depression when he said it, but he said that uh, if Ezekiel says the eyes wax feeble, this prophecy is largely fulfilled at the present time, as I perceive in myself and many others. They know very well all that must be believed, but their faith and assent is so dull that they are oppressed by sleep, are heavy of heart, and unable to raise themselves up to God. And then he held that such states of lukewarmness were to be banished by means of fear. Uh, says, but woe to him who permits the feeling of self-righteousness to take the place of weariness, for there is no greater unrighteousness than excessive righteousness. His words. Uh, and, they said, and then in the latter words, he seems to be alluding to the people he referred to as the little saints and the ostensibly self-righteous members of his order. And we'll see later on, he even attacked his own order. We'll see that very shortly. And at a certain point, he said, we live in a false peace and fancy that we can draw on the treasure of the merits of Christ and the saints. So here he is denying the, the treasury of the church. Which essentially holds that, of course, the, the merits of the passion of Christ are so great, are infinite, and then all, taking also into account all of the merits of, of all the other saints, or lady and the saints, that the church can draw from those things and uh, you know, essentially apply those towards. Right? For example, if, the, if a mass is not you know, offered validly, the church could supply for that uh, with the, uh, uh, by, you know, since, since condoning that, the church could supply for that the lack of that mass having been sent for that intention through, from the treasury of the church. It's also the principle that, of course, indulgences come from. So he's he's a, and he's attacking good works, he's attacking indulgences, and he's also attacking the doctrine of the the treasury of the church. And he 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 so he ridiculed it by saying popes and bishops are flinging about graces and indulgences. You know, so uh, using the term flinging about, he could just say that which they do. Obviously, the church has the jurisdiction to you know, say distribute indulgences to grant indulgences. He's using the term flinging to make it derogatory. Uh, and he, uh, of course, in his sermons and as a result, he, he was diminishing the respect of his, especially more youthful hearers, for the authority of the church. So speaking out the, about the religious life, he said, here come men of religion and vaunt their confraternities and indulgences at every street corner, only to beg money for food and clothing. Oh, those begging friars, those begging friars. And then he you says know, once again, those begging friars. Perhaps you are to be excused because you receive alms in God's name and preach the word and perform other services gratis. That may be, but see you look to it. And keep in mind, he's still a member of the Augustinian order at this point. So he's attacking mendicants and Augustinian hermits are mendicants. So very strange, but this shows the direction he was moving. So he attack, is attacking the own, in fact, the very constitution of his congregation. And uh, in his, it's interesting to note that in his commentary on the Psalms, he frequently at one and the same time rails against the self-righteous and holy by works uh, at, uh, and, at opposition to, uh, and at the opposition party in his order, uh, it was not so easy to see, to distinguish against whom his attacks were directed. So again, he's, he's using it at the moment to attack really his own order. Uh, he'll use it, of course, more generally later, but at this point he's using it more, mostly to attack his own order. And then at this, already at this period, he shows a certain tendency to underestimate uh, the value of Christian good works and to insist one-sidedly on the power and efficacy of faith and on the application of the merits of Christ. So he's, at this point, it's, he's, he may be ridiculing it to, to a degree, and he's, he's definitely placing more emphasis on, on the efficacy of faith and the application of the merits of Christ. Uh, but... And he hasn't quite gone into full-blown revolution against the church yet. 
And then very emphatically, as opposed to trust in good works and merits, he insists on the, the grace of Christ, the nuda et sola misericordia dei et benignitas gratuita, which must be our support and stay. So the, in other words, the, the naked and, and sole grace of God, uh, mercy of God, sorry, and his uh, gratuitous benignity. So very much emphasizing uh, the mercy of God, uh, overemphasizing it, which of course he'll take to extremes later on. And of course, we're looking at these things that really are foreboding his later errors. Um, and then with regard to, with reference to man's natural powers, Luther's cardinal point is that neither the ability to be good and pleasing to God, nor the freedom of choosing what is right and good in, in spite of concupiscence is denied. Uh, so he's not, he's not denying that man can do good at this point. He will deny that later. Uh, he frequently says, he frequently, yes, he still says at this point that concupiscence has to be driven back, has, must not be allowed mastery. So he still, he still holds that at this time. Though he says it will always make itself felt. And of course, that can be understood correctly. And, uh, yes, we always have, we have the effects of original sin, uh, effects of concupiscence. Although it's interesting to note, it's, I've heard it said that we had that instance read of, I think we, I think we, were, we passed that yet? I can't remember, in the book on St. Thomas, uh, his, he's being held essentially prisoner in the tower and they, his brothers you know, bring, bring some woman who's trying to seduce him and he chases her away. It's said that after that, St. Thomas never suffered a temptation against chastity again. So it said. But I mean, that's not the normal course of events. <laughs> Usually we uh, suffer these things for a long time. So he says that it's like a Red Sea through the midst of which we must pass, refusing our consent to the temptations which press upon us like an advancing tide. Obviously, that's true. You have to uh, take the means to well, to avoid those things, prevent them from rising in the first place. But when they when they do come, to actually run away from them is the way to overcome them. But that that's more spiritual conference material. Uh, so he still admits the, uh, the, the treasury of merits, the tesaurus meritorum, the treasury of the church. He still admits it, though we saw earlier that he was mocking it and definitely will lead to his denying it, uh, from which indulgences derive their efficacy uh, and without taking offense alludes to satisfaction, so the satisfactio operis, to works of, to works of supererogation as also to the place of purification in the, in the next world, so purgatory. He still talks about purgatory. Um, so he hasn't denied all these things yet, but we see his move towards it. Yes. What year is that? This is well, still it's when he's his earlier work. So we're talking about uh, say 15, 15, 15, 16, 17, in that time frame. Again, he hasn't denied, he hasn't quite published his theses yet. We're looking more at his general writings, but this is before he's actually published his theses. Uh, so, yes, 15, 15, 15, 16 is what we're looking at here. So in the sermons which Luther during his uh, uh, professor, professorship preached at Wittenberg in 1515 and 1516, uh, he uses a um, uh, cutting and ironical censures against people uh, who, who perpetrate anything he considers a, sees an abuse or an excess which pervades in the exercise of the priestly office, especially preaching. And there may have been these things. But again, it's, uh, his tone, as you see, was rather vicious. Uh, he was displeased with certain excesses in the veneration of the saints, in which we're not denying that such things may have taken place. Uh, and he reproves what he considers wrong in the popular celebration of the festivals of the church and in other matters. But again, here we might be moving more into the realm of it's a, opinion. Uh, let's see, these. See, but even aside from his denunciation of the conditions in the church, his prevailing tone is one of uh, <coughs> hastiness, we could call it, and self-sufficiency. Uh, he's very, very harsh all the time in this, and rather, let's be prideful also. You see, he's very, very definitely infected with pride here. He complains, uh, at, perhaps with some reason, that at the time preaching had fallen to a very low ebb in Germany. Again, not denying that there were problems. Uh, he says he complained that preachers too often treated of trivial and useless subjects and enlarged uh, on subjects belonging to the province of philosophy and theology. Uh, I, the sense being, I suppose, losing the people to whom they were speaking, or being too 
too erudite in what they were saying and losing their audiences. And losing themselves also, he says, in artificial allegorical interpretations of sacred scripture. Whatever that's supposed to mean. Maybe this, they were contrary to his own. He said that. It's not entirely clear what exactly he's complaining about there, but he said that. Uh, I mean, it's also, it is true. There's a general rule in your, in your preaching. You have to know your audience. Uh, if you just pull something out of, of Gary, it may be excellent, but maybe nobody will understand it. Uh, yeah, I have to. That's the one thing you have to do a lot in, in your preparing sermon material. You have to has to be processed in a sense. If you find something even that's, you know, it could be excellent and it may be clear to somebody who's had some training in philosophy and theology, but you have to remember that you, know, you have people here who I mean, may be coming to, maybe coming to, to the traditional medicine hearing the Catholic faith for the first time. <laughs> it's always possible that there's a one person who has never heard any of this before. It's all news to him. So it's not, I mean, not to say that, not to, just that will find who that one person is, but just remember that everybody's at a, essentially at a different level of knowledge of the faith. So essentially, it never hurts to make write sermons based on catechism things, because even the devout people won't have any problem hearing it again. But that this is more like that's more like for a homiletics class. Uh, but of course, the irony of it is that. Even in Luther's own sermons, we see some of these defects that he talks about. <laughs> uh, well, of course, and it's also uh, disedifying. In fact, it's forbidden by canon law to denounce people from the pulpit. That's what if you, if you, I guess, probably not doing any canon law classes this year. But when you, when you, when you see, when you look at it, uh, things that uh, regulated concerning preaching. One of the things is exactly that, no, no denunciations from the pulpit. Not to say that not denouncing errors, but no personal denunciations. Uh, but, it, these, but our author says that even his own sermons, we can find these barren speculations, as he calls them. So you know, in other words, things that are not going to really be any use to the audience he's speaking to. And also too much coarse and exaggerated declamation. So yeah, he's not free of these problems himself. And then his Christmas sermons of 1515, uh, he did not scruple to place himself on the same footing as prophets, wise men, and those learned in, in the scriptures whose persecution Christ foretold, and especially being among the last of those groups. And we see his, even that was unorthodox. He said, there are some who by study of sacred scripture form themselves into teachers and who are taught neither by men nor directly by God alone. And these are the ones who are supposed to be learned in the scriptures. They exercise themselves in the knowledge of the truth by meditation and research. Thus, they become able to interpret the Bible and to write for the instruction of others. Then he continues that such men are persecuted. And as the Lord prophesied of the prophets and wise men and scribes that they would not be received, but attacked, so also it is with me, he says. So, so yes, he's prideful, no doubt. He said, they, they murmur against my teaching as I am aware and oppose it. They reproach me with being in error because I preach always of Christ as the hen under whose wings all who wish to seem righteous must gather. So if he's complaining about excessive self-righteousness, <laughs> we should apply that to himself. <laughs> uh, so his ideas with regard to righteousness uh, must have been looked upon as, in his, of course, he's being very importunate and exaggerating here. And you know, even, even crossing the line into being erroneous, placing himself as someone who's got false ideas as uh, being persecuted for the truth. Uh, and then he, but he tries to defend himself from that. He says, what I have said is this, we are not saved by our righteousness, but it is, but it is the wings of the hen which protect us against the birds of prey, meaning against the devil. It says, but as it was with the Jews who persecuted righteousness, so it is today. My adversaries do not know what righteousness is. They call their own fancies grace. They become birds of prey and pounce upon the chicks who hope for salvation through the mercy of our hen. So uh, basically saying, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I maybe, maybe he admits, okay, maybe I'm being a little self-righteous here, but uh, my, everybody I'm attacking is worse. <laughs> That's essentially what he's saying. So we have a strong idea, a strong picture here, a very clear picture of his of his disputatious temper. He very he definitely 
uh, like to argue if he's if he's saying such rude things like this, uh, denouncing his his adversaries from the pulpit as birds of prey, and is basically arrogating to himself the the role of lawmaker, is you know, just a little self righteous. Uh, so of course, think about it. If his Augustinian superiors had been doing their jobs, they would have you know, reproved him for saying things like that. But clearly, nothing was forthcoming because uh, he kept doing these things. Or at least the diocesan authorities uh, in, in the di of the diocese in which Wittenberg, the University of Wittenberg, is located, should have you know, intervened to stop him giving these scandalously offensive sermons. But the evil was left unchecked, and so it took deeper root. And of course, he's he started to he started to very much get gain quite a following among the younger monks who were at the university, among the townsmen. In fact, he, he got a number of uh, bold and enthusiastic followers. Uh, and Staupitz, we've talked about before, was on his side in all of this. So the fellow he he originally had opposed in bringing all of the the strict observance monasteries under his control, and to fight whom he had gone to Rome. He's, and, but subsequently upon returning to switch sides, is now helping him. And not only advancing him academically, but also protecting him. And when he starts saying things like this, he, does not, he doesn't censure him in any way, uh, and uh, basically uh, sides with him. Uh, so his religious superior is on his side, and also the elector of Saxony. And also, just to be clear, when we talk about these electors, that's referring to the, the people who, who voted in order to select the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor was selected through a process of election, although those electors themselves were in positions of, they were very high nobles. Uh, they were princes who, were, who, who themselves received their positions through hereditary right. So here the electors, that refers to the electing the Holy Roman Emperor. But uh, it wasn't like everybody in, in the territories that were assigned to the Holy Roman Empire voted. It was, you had these specifically, very specifically designated high-ranking electors who, as I said, uh, received their own positions uh, by virtue of which they were made electors by hereditary right. Uh, so he has the elector of Saxony on his side, uh, but yeah, it was for political reasons, because Luther himself admits that uh, the, this prince was uh, of little authority on theological matters. Uh, Luther described him as uh, being in, in things concerning God and the salvation of the soul almost seven times blind. But again, politically, you can see why it would be attractive for him to side with Luther, because if he, he knows almost... he's. Um, severely lacking in knowledge of theological matters, perhaps even just in the basic knowledge of the faith. And, and Luther is telling him, oh, yes, you, you can do whatever you want. And if a heretic telling you to do whatever you want and you yourself know very little, you're going to give him your protection. That's, so what could be more natural? You know, if, yeah, if that's your, <laughs> if that's your uh, mode of operating. Uh, So now he started giving sermons in the summer of 1516. Uh, a time, it was at a time when he had already expressed some of his errors plainly in his lectures on the Epistle to the Romans, which we'll see later. Uh, his notes, these notes we're talking about, afford us something of uh, a glimpse of, of, this, of this controversy. So his sermons were dealing with the first commandment. Uh, so he said, uh, for the, so he's, he's in sermon for the gospel the se for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. He was preaching on the words, beware of false prophets. Of course, that gives him very tempting opportunity for uh, to take shots at his adversaries. So uh, on July 6th, he attacked them uh, from the standpoint of his new ideas on righteousness. He said, much fasting and long prayers, study, preaching, watching, and poor clothing. These are the pious lambskins under which ravening wolves hide themselves. Of course, any such thing, again, study, exactly what he's talking about here, study, preaching, uh, uh, sleeping only very little, uh, fasting, penitential works. Obviously, all of those things do have to be done with a good intention. Uh, it's a principle, just a, a principle of moral theology that if you do any work, even if it's a good work with, a, with an evil intention, vitiates the work. The work becomes evil as a result. It's, 
sinful, not, not meritorious to do it with an evil intention. Uh, but, of course, if the work is good in itself and done with a good intention, then it is meritorious. But it seems here that he's, he's attacking, again, moving in that direction, attacking all good works across the board uh, without, any, without even acknowledging the possibility that uh, these things could be meritorious if done with the right intention. Uh, he said that in their case, in the people he's attacking, they're only done for show. So perhaps at this point he doesn't exclude the possibility that these things could be done well, but he's certainly attacking them as if all of their motives are evil. So, uh, interestingly enough, he's also attacking the observantines here, in other words, those, those uh, religious who follow the strict rule of St. Augustine. Uh, again, the people for whom he was, he did fight at one point. Uh, but he's... Uh, he, he describes them because of their, obviously they're going to be, when they're strict, or they're going to practice more mortifications, etc. Uh, he, he attacked them for their display of holiness as being heretics and schismatics. On what grounds, they're not clear. They just didn't like them, so he attacked them for being that, perhaps. But it's not clear why he thought that, or he would have used those terms, you know, aside from just pure invective. Uh, And uh, he also, he, he's attacking them also probably because they were apparently among the first to criticize him. <laughs> so that's going to you know, get him riled up against them if they start criticizing some of the things he's saying. And then uh, he made so, follow, some remarks on rebellion and defamation. He said, the true works by which we may recognize the prophets are done in the inner and hidden man. But these proud men are wanting above all in patience and the charity which is forgetful of self, but concern for others. When they have to do works which are not to their liking, they are slow, rebellious, obstinate. But they know well how to take away the name of others and to pass judgment on them. There is no greater plague in the church today than men with the words, good works are necessary in their mouths. Men who refuse to distinguish between what is good and evil because they are enemies of the cross meaning uh, enemies of the good things of God. So, yeah, attacking good works again. And then uh, for his Sunday for July 27th, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, he, uh, in uh, attempting to show the, the danger of the times, uh, trying to describe how powerful the devil had become, and how unto the appearance of good works he was making certain persons fine breakers of the first commandment. Whatever that is supposed to mean. But what he said was, uh, these venture to shoot arrows secretly against <laughs> those who are right of heart. So he's con constantly attacking people who are doing good works. Even if he hasn't quite fully developed everything yet of the, who's in his doctrine. He said in, in another sermon, his opponents had to submit to being called in an allusion to the Sunday's gospel of the Pharisee and publican, real Pharisees who, by reason of their assumed holiness and merits, seek the praise of men. Whereas in reality, with their self-righteousness, they have merely erected an idol in their hearts. So, describing the worst possible motives to everybody at this point. Uh, but again, if we look at Luther's own theological studies, uh, I mean, keep in mind, he's a professor at the University of Wittenberg. Uh, if we look at his own preparation for that office, we'll see that uh, his knowledge of the doctrine of the church, of the fathers, and at least good scholasticism in general, was far too meager for his taking up a, a serious academic post like that. And it was not only time which was wanting, in his case, for a uh, deep course of theological study. Remember how quickly he was ordained. It was within a year or two of his entering uh, the monastery. So he was ordained very quickly. So there, was, there wasn't really time for him to study as well as he needed to. He'd already started doing these things. Uh, but he was even, even in the time that he did have, he wasn't given a, a good presentation of theology. It certainly wasn't Thomistic, as we'll see. In fact, our author says that the great scholastics of the, of the Middle Ages, um, uh, St. Uh, Albert the Great, St. Thomas of Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, were almost completely unknown to him. So 
he <laughs> that's clearly not going to help him if he hasn't if he's barely even been exposed to them. Uh, see, especially Saint Thomas. Uh, obviously, even even then, even in the 16th century, was was of course all, already approved by the Holy See uh, to uh, for for use in teaching, and he was not exposed to it. And he, uh, we'll see it later, but he frequently displayed utter utter ignorance of Thomism. So what he did receive was a training in a nominalistic philosophy and theology, uh, which, uh, of course, he's going to give him a, a a very crippled idea of scholasticism. So his the school that he was trained in was that of William of Ockham. Who has very different titles? Or I'll think of as Doctor Singularis or Invincibilis, Venerabilis, Inceptor Nominalium. Various different titles given to William of Ockham uh, was one of the um, boldest in his in his teachings uh, in the domain of philosophy and theology. Uh, his, uh, in his theological questions, his uh, his ideas concerning poverty actually came into conflict with those of the, the Pope at the time that he was living. His sentences were condemned by the University of Paris. He appealed from the Holy See to a general council, was excommunicated in 1328, protested against the decisions of the general chapter of the order, and then took refuge with Louis of Bavaria, who was a schismatic, whose literary defender he became. So that's the school in which Luther's being trained. <laughs> You know, the originator is uh, not exactly a saint. So he, he revived the nominalism. And if you've seen all of the modern eras, we don't need to go through all of it. Uh, but he revived nominalism in philosophy and theology. Uh, his teaching was so much that of the schools through which Luther had been, that, la that the latter, Luther, declared sum occamice factionis. So I, he said, I am of the school of, of Occam. Uh, he, he spoke of Occam as being magister meus. So, he, he, he never denied himself having been educated in this, although we'll see, actually, he didn't like it. He didn't like uh, Arkham's teachings. Uh, although, you know, our, our author says that Luther didn't, <coughs> did not pride himself on being Arkham's disciple, uh, and that he would, um, he, so he, didn't pride, he didn't pride himself on it. And when he said, uh, I am of Arkham's party, uh, he's, you know, he said, even he said, Occam, my beloved master, he was, he was saying that you know, sarcastically. He was, he was joking when he said it, uh, because he wanted to actually accuse him, uh, of being, uh, of having held tremendous errors. And actually we'll see that, that some of Luther's ideas, he took some things from that school, but some of his things are actually in reaction to certain assertions of the Occamist school. So yeah, we'll see all of that. But he, he's going to, on occasion, sarcastically refer to Occam as, being his beloved master, uh, because uh, before attacking him for the false ideas that he reacted to to form his own heresies. Uh, see, but he still did apparently place Occam much higher than Saint Thomas Aquinas. He also show how little he knew about Saint Thomas, if he thought that. Uh, and of course, like, he despised really this, the teaching of Saint Thomas. Uh, let's see, but again, yeah, he he really did not like the uh, the school of Occam. He said uh, we had to give him speaking of speaking of Occam. He said we had to give him the title of venerabilis, uh, uius secte, meaning scholae, so the school primus re reportor, uh, reperator. Uh, but he added after that, so to the people he was speaking to, this was in his table talks. In other words, he was just a lot of a lot of the things that we that come from Luther come from his, what I call his table talks, and essentially he was sitting around, uh, like casually speaking to people, uh, probably drinking, based on some of the things he said. Uh, but <laughs> it's true. Uh, but he said in one of these occasions, he said, happy are you in not having to learn the dung which was offered me. So uh, that, that, that's mild coming from Luther. <laughs> but he said that. Uh, but apparently he did actually relatively little reading of Occam's actual works. 
because they're apparently enormous and, and difficult to penetrate. So he learned fr more from uh, other writers who had broken it down. Right? More or less what, uh, say, Gary Gu, for us, is to St. Thomas. In other words, uh, processing and making it easier to understand. Or at least that's the idea. Um, he read authors who did that for Occam, supposedly made it easier <laughs> to understand, uh, breaking it down for him. Uh, but he, one of his, one of the people he followed, maybe you've heard of him, on our is uh, Gabriel Biel, uh, was one of these authors that he uh, uh, consulted, uh, and that's and we'll refer to him later. So it was. Uh, I mean, you know, not, not to get too much into the philosophical side of it, but. Uh, the nominalism led alchemists to an excessive estimate of the powers of nature and an undervaluing of grace, and also to an incorrect view of the supernatural. Uh, so they were disposed to neglect sacred scripture and to set too much store on their speculations, and that with re uh, also with regard to the relations between reason and faith, they did not abide by the approved principles and practice of earlier scholastics. So, and these are some of the things that Luther will Re, uh, react to more negatively. He'll, instead of taking them for his own, he will, uh, he will react, reacting against them, will form his own ideas that are on the opposite extreme. Again, as, as we've been saying, some of the elements of which the, the alchemist uh, theology was made up uh, repelled him, whereas some others attracted him. So he took what he, he liked and, and, and formulated the opposite of what he didn't like. But the, the things he didn't like filled him with uh, a distaste for anything that was considered scholasticism in, uh, scholasticism in general. So he hated studying philosophy. But, other, but some of its elements that attracted him were uh, those which were in, in conformity, of course, with his own <laughs> ideas and feelings that he was, you know, feelings that he, of course, had and was bringing his, his, his doctrines, if you want to call them that, in accordance with them, uh, ideas he was already formulating. So uh, uh, this naturalism uh, brought about uh, this idea of excessive independence. And that, of course, something that appealed to him, as we see developed later on in his ideas of, of uh, personal inspiration, private interpretation. So he, he, some of these ideas of, of nominalism he greedily seized upon, uh, such as uh, the idea of imputation of merits. Uh, he had been groping about for a system of, of theology to suit his ideas, and he seized on that. That, that came from the alchemist school. So you can see, and we'll, we'll see it later in his commentary on the Epistle of the Romans, but there were some uh, certain disputations uh, that um, uh, different letters, writings that had survived uh, that, it, that show that there was some opposition uh, between Luther and even his own school. Again, you've probably seen in, in the modern areas how, according to the nominalists, general ideas are exactly that nomina, only empty words, that they apply themselves only to what is was actual and tangible. Uh, so it was, it was fond of displaying its dialectic and even its, uh, and it's quite insolent, at the expense of, uh, of theology, uh, of the Catholic faith, in fact. So. Oh, okay. Well, it's getting started on this part. All right. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Sub tuum presidium confugimus sancta Dei genitrix, nostras deprecationes et dispicias in necessitatibus et a periculis cumquis libera nos semper, virgo gloriosa et benedicta. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.